A bill going through the United States legislature is seeking to counter what it views as the oil petroleum exporting country's ability to fix oil prices. The no oil producing and exporting cartel bill seeks to make illegal any activity that restrains the production of oil or gas and the setting of fuel prices. The bill has previously been rejected under the Obama and Bush administrations, but with uh, President Donald Trump not being uh, shy about uh, how he feels about OPEC and its uh, policy decisions, the bill, which appears to have uh, bipartisan support, could gain some traction. Well, to speak about how OPEC can mitigate this bill, if it becomes law and the role of African voices in the exclusive OPEC club. I'm joined in studio by NJ Ayuk. He's uh, a lawyer enlisted to assist OPEC in mitigating the possible effects of any new legislation. Thanks very much for joining us, NJ. Thank you so much for yeah, having me. Good stuff. So I'm sure you would agree or you wouldn't that it's fair to say that OPEC is indeed a cartel. I mean, it, it, it comes together and uh, in historically when it had a lot more dominance in the oil market, it would basically determine prices by the amount it had in the market and the amount the, the amount it put in the market of oil and the amount that it took out. It has less power now, obviously, because there are more producers of oil. But would you agree that essentially it is a cartel? I don't think it is a cartel. I think it is a group of people coming together because a cartel is when you have a price target. OPEC has no price target. OPEC just has a sense to say the market is at a position where we are suffering domestically, but we have to do something. So sitting together and discussing these policies, but there's never has been an OPEC resolution that says we have a price target at $90 or $100 or $200. That has never been the objective of OPEC. So I think when you look at the United States, there's a lot of communications and there's a lot of discussion on this, and they say, well, it's a, it's a cartel. And if you, if you phrase it that way, then, it, then most people just buy into it. But I think there is never a price target with OPEC. There is all, there's always a discussion on increasing prices to fit the domestic economy mm -hmm. and also ensuring that those who have the resources, they receive the right value for the resources that are being produced in their country. Because at the end of the day, their resources have to mean something for the people in the countries that produce the oil. You cannot produce oil and then your people don't have any value. It makes no sense. Fair enough. So now, if the US bill does go through, um, <coughs> what will it mean or how will it impact the US market? I mean, how much oil does OPEC actually funnel to the United States? OPEC does funnel a lot of oil into, into the United States. But also, right now, America is a net ex export of oil. America is producing about 78 million barrels of oil a day. And they are tra actually consuming almost 90% of that. The problem right now is that once that bill ca gets in there, it's not necessarily, necessarily how much oil OPEC sends into the United States. It is, the, it is the litigious actions that could happen to OPEC states that have any kind of business with the United States or American partners. Mm. So then how would you then deal with that? I mean, how does international law deal with that? Because it's the US making a domestic policy, a domestic piece of legislation to effectively fight OPEC nations. That is the point. They use a domestic American legislation to really combat what they believe are price fixes or something that doesn't work. We live in a free market economy. The market has to work for itself. The real question you have to look at it is that these countries, no matter what the situation is, they have to stand up for their own national interests. The American consumer doesn't really, really benefit because the question we, we have to always think, how have the prices gotten to this point? President Trump, um, President Trump went against the Obama administration Iran deal. You are putting four million barrels out of the market by putting sanctions on Iran. Mm. And then you're talking to Saudi Arabia to say, well, you guys have to find production on extra one million barrels. That still doesn't fix the problem. Venezuela, at the present moment, because of the chaos and constant threats that they're having, their production facilities are in disarray. 
And when you had a 2008 financial crisis, we stopped investing in exploration. If you don't explore, you cannot produce. So you got to go back to the basics. You got to start exploring. You got to start investing in exploration. Then you're going to have steady supply because nobody wants volatility in the market. We want stability. Mm. So the Americans have to look at the American domestic actions are really impacting them now. It's kind of like chickens coming back home to roost. They cannot, at one point, go after Iran. You cannot go after Venezuela. You cannot stop investing and reaching out in new markets. And then at the same time, you say, well, give me more. It's a collaborative effort. So, but I think it also defeats the purpose of American ingenuity. Mm. It defeats what you see in America, where people start businesses, go out there, do their best, and really develop something. You cannot do something that it's going to go against what Americans have championed all their lives. AJ, we're running out of time, but I just quickly wanted to ask you about African nations who are in OPEC, Nigeria, Angola, and more recently, Congo, Brazzaville. What type of voice do they have in OPEC when they've got a giant like Saudi Arabia in there? You only get out what you put in. African voices have a strong place at the table. They have to use it well. The, tr the truth of the matter is that right now you have more African nations than Middle Eastern nations at OPEC. So we can actually shape policy to really Im impact the African consumers. And one other thing we have to look at is that the African consumer is very diverse. In South Africa, the consumer is very, very alert on high prices. In Nigeria or Angola, Equatorial Guinea, they want high prices because it has a lot to do with revenue coming to the states. Mm -hmm. So there is a diversity in an, in, an African, in an African place at the table. This year, the South African minister was at OPEC. So all those voices are nothing. What is beautiful for OPEC is that Africa is reflective of what the global market um, is. And I think that African discussion going into OPEC, it's a good thing for, the con for, for uh, OPEC and for the, the continent, for the oil and gas community. NJ, thank you very much for your time. We'll speak to you further the next time. That was NJ Ayuka. Thank you. He's a lawyer for OPEC.